All right, well, good morning. And uh, my name is Matty Stratton. I'm the Director of Developer Relations at Ivan, and that's as much as I'm gonna talk about that. But what I do wanna talk about today is kind of an evolution, kind of a journey. DevOps is 12 some years old. We've been doing this for a while, and things have maybe changed. Uh, the world we're looking at, the work that we're trying to do. Uh, so we'll take a look at that. We're gonna kind of look at how, how this journey goes from where we had DevOps and then this idea of cloud engineering. And I'd like to start by looking back a little bit, kind of history can teach us a lot of things. Sometimes it can just teach us that things were funny. I don't know, we'll see what happens. Uh, so one thing, we talked about DevOps is a little bit over 10 years old in 2009, was kind of this real inflection point year and a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. So one of the things that happened in 2009 is John Allspa and Paul Hammond from Flickr gave this talk at the Velocity Conference called 10 Deploys Per Day, Dev and Ops Cooperation at Flickr. And sitting in the audience of this talk, first of all, by the way, this blew everybody's mind, 10 deploys a day, holy crap. Right now we're like let's do 10 deploys a nanosecond if you're Amazon or something, but it really blew everybody's mind. Uh, the fun fact is what most people got hung up on was well, what auto, how are you how are you doing this with the technology? And you're like, no, the cooperation part. But uh, sitting in the audience was a fellow named Andrew Clay Schaefer, and he was tweeting about it. And best we can tell from Twitter archaeology is this is the first use of the word DevOps was in this tweet from Andrew. So um, it's it's all his fault. Uh, Another thing that happened in 2009 is uh, Jez Humble and Dave Farley uh, published this book called Continuous Delivery. And this was based on a lot of work that they had done at ThoughtWorks. And um, there's kind of a fun story. There's, there's this uh, fella that I always consider as the unsung hero of continuous delivery. And it's a gentleman named Chris Reed. Does anybody know Chris Reed? Cool, Chris says hi. He actually asked me to do that. Uh, the fun thing about Chris is, the genesis for this book was a paper called The Deployment Production Line that was written by Jez, Chris, and Dave North uh, a couple of years prior to that. But everybody knows uh, the continuous delivery book. And the, the, my introduction to this was Jez was a guest on a podcast called The DevOps Cafe. And this is when I was first starting to learn about DevOps. And I remember viscerally, I was driving down the Eisenhower Expressway in Chicago, driving out to see my kids, and I'm listening to this podcast, and Jez is talking about the idea of continuous delivery. I'm working at a technology company at the time. I'm working at apartments.com, and I'm yelling at the radio in my car, well, that's fine, but that wouldn't work at apartments. I wouldn't work. And then Jez explains that they did this at HP with LaserJet firmware, and I sat there in my car, and I said, oh. Um, and that also leads to another thing that happened in 2009 is that um, Gary Groover and his team at HP uh, published a book called A Practical Approach to Large-Scale Agile Development. This is a book about DevOps, they just didn't call it DevOps. And uh, so, you know, we think about like, oh, I can't, you know, deliver software using Docker or whatever. They were doing this with hardware, firmware. It was pretty impressive. And this all sort of leads into uh, kind of the story of how we got here is you know, we talked about Andrew had this tweet and then there was an Agile event. And at this event, uh, Andrew Clay Schaefer proposed a birds of a feather session, like the open spaces we do, about doing uh, Agile system administration. And one person showed up to that birds of a feather session. It wasn't Andrew, it was a Belgian gent named Patrick Dubois, who I don't think Patrick's actually here this morning, so it's good, so he can't check my history. Uh, but then sure enough, a little bit later, they did get together and decided, to put on a conference to talk about these ideas. So if you ever want to know why we call it DevOps, it's because Agile System Administration was too long of a name for a conference. So they put on this event in 2009 in Ghent called DevOps Days, right? And the thing I think is fascinating, if we look at this first DevOps Days, we look at the six talks that were there, you could actually probably see almost of these talks, at, almost of these? Almost any of these talks at the DevOps Days today, right? Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting when we think about the evolution of DevOps days is uh, when we kind of moved on and we take a look at where DevOps days came from, and DevOps comes from this community. So much of the practice of this is embedded in this thing, and we kind of look at the growth over the years and years, right? So 2009, there was the one event in Ghent. We had a couple in 2010, the first one in North America in Silicon Valley, or Valley in Mountain View, and we really see this, this big peak, and then I don't know, we're, we're still doing the analysis. We're not really sure what happened in 2020, why they dipped like that, but 
<laughs> but we're coming back. But one thing I think is very fascinating and, and really cool when you think about the, the global community that is DevOps coming from DevOps days is in 2019, um, for the 10th anniversary of the first uh, DevOps days in Ghent, they, we, you know, I, I, I'm gonna say they, I showed up, I didn't help run it. Uh, we, there was another DevOps days Ghent. But the day before, we had an organizer day. We had an organizer summit. So people who organized DevOps days from all over the world came together to spend a day in this kind, in a DevOps days kind of way to learn from each other. And if you looked at the numbers, there were more people at that organizer summit than we're at the first DevOps days in Ghent in 2009. So the growth is, is really good. And again, we tend to look at how many DevOps days there's been um, this year so far, and we're, we're back to 2017 numbers. And it's a mix of you know, virtual and, and, and all that. So that's sort of one of the places. It's real important to think about the community where these come from. But what the heck is DevOps? Like, let's, let's sort of, you know, I like definitions. Definitions help us speak a common vocabulary. You know, we've, we've firmly pointed the finger of blame at Andrew for that tweet that, that make us say we talk about DevOps, but what does that mean? So Donovan Brown at Microsoft has a, one way of putting it that I really like, where he said, you know, it's the union of people, process, and products. Um, and I like it not just because of the alliteration, and, but it's about value. Okay, cool. Uh, a couple of years ago, I pressured Andrew to give me a definition of DevOps. He didn't want to do it, and I kept badgering him until he finally did. And he said, okay, it's optimizing this human experience and performance of operating software uh, with software and humans. So again, he gets really mad when I show this one because he obviously didn't copy edit it. But the key is the word human comes up in there twice, right? And so that's cool. So we heard from Donovan, we heard from Andrew. It's a bunch of dudes. And then Emily Freeman, who's the author of DevOps for Dummies, has another one I really like, which is about collaboration, ownership, and learning. So these are all kind of this core idea, right? We're driving value, we're collaborating, it's about the people, it's about the socio-technical system. And of course, while we can know what DevOps is, uh, a few years ago I asked Twitter what DevOps is not. So if you think it's any of these things, you're probably wrong. Um, it's not your khakis, it's not just reading the Phoenix Project, et cetera. Cool, all right. There's a well-known uh, way of describing DevOps using a common acronym called COMS. If you've heard of COMS, I'm gonna go through this a little bit. Not gonna to go too in depth, but I'm gonna use this as kind of a reference point. And COMS uh, stands for Culture, Automation, Lean, Measurement, and Sharing. The order matters only because it spells a word. None is more important than another. So you could also make it, you could say it could be clams, if you like that better, or smalk. Um, and, and this has stood up over a long time. So the idea, it actually originally was called CAMS, and um, Damon Edwards and John Willis came up with that in 2010, and we're still talking about it today. And we keep trying to come up with new ways to describe DevOps, and they don't stick around, so I think this one's here. Um, so when we think about, I'm gonna review them just sort of very quickly about where, where I think about them. So culture um, is, is a big part of why we're here. And I, I, I love this uh, quote from uh, Lloyd Taylor. He says, you know, this is a key thing. He says, you can't, directly change culture. So I'm sure we've seen leaders and executives that are like, we're gonna do a cultural transformation in our organization. We are gonna change the culture. Here's the new culture. It doesn't work that way. But what you can do is you can change behavior and the behavior exemplifies and expresses that culture. And actually the way that you change behavior is affecting incentives. A lot of times people say, hey Maddie, what's the most important DevOps book I can read? And I will say that book is Freakonomics. Learn about incentives, you'll understand DevOps. Now Freakonomics is problematic in its own ways, but you can kind of skip those parts. Everything doesn't stand the test of time. So automation, is what a lot of people tend to think of when they think of DevOps. Mostly people not in this room necessarily, but they'll think it's this. And, and the thing about automation is it's super key. Um, and this is a quote from the continuous delivery book that I really love, which says, you know, if we're asking experts to do boring and repetitive but technically challenging things, it's one of the surest ways to have them make mistakes short of having them be overtired or drunk. And that's sort of the world we were in, right? Because it's a really boring stuff, but you can't, but you have to be highly skilled to do it. And automation is really key for the delivery of value that we're trying to do. We can't move at the scale if we have to do things by hand. This is also the part of uh, DevOps that requires the least amount of convincing to anybody because this is the fun part. This is the toys, this is the tools. People say we over-rotate on culture and it's like because I don't have to convince a bunch of engineers to play with tools. We're gonna just do that already, right? 
Uh, lean came in, at first it was CAMS, uh, Jez added Lean um, a few years later. This is thinking about lean manufacturing principles and kind of, a, it's a lot about waste reduction. And a couple of the key ideas in this are, you know, elimination of waste and this idea of value stream mapping. And I'm not gonna dig too much into, into this, but it's a matter, but I always find this really interesting. When I work with organizations, very few people look at the whole process from beginning to end and understand everything that happens. We know our part. And when you kind of get everybody together and say, when we start, if we're going on that journey from you know, idea to, to feedback to the customer, or you know, sometimes we say commit to cash, right? Uh, the time between a commit to we're getting paid. Then you start to look at it and you go, oh, nobody really thought about that there's this chunk here. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about value stream mapping, Steve Pereira, who's one of the organizers of DevOps Days Tor Toronto, is a great value stream person. I've got a whole bunch of reference links at the end. But we're really trying to look at, at reduction of bottlenecks, reduction of waste, et cetera. Um, when we think about measurement, is it's not about justifying our existence with metrics, but we don't know that something we're doing is changing, is affecting in the right way unless we're measuring it. And I think this was really, in a lot of ways, it was exemplified um, by the State of DevOps report that uh, first initially came out a few years into the DevOps movement, because before we had that, before we had DORA and the DORA metrics and, and all of those things, we kind of knew DevOps was good, but we didn't know why. Right, we had to take a lot of things on faith. So measurement helps us be able to see that we are making changes for uh, positive or, or negative. And then sharing um, is kind of what ties this all up together. And it's, it's uh, oftentimes one of the hardest things to do in an organization. Knowledge is power. People feel, especially at an executive level, that things are on need to know basis. The reality is the, the list of things that are need to know is, is, is smaller than we think. So this is pretty cool. I think when I look at this, I'm like, I mean, hopefully, I mean, we're all sitting at a DevOps days, I'm maybe a little bit preaching to the converted in some ways, but when I first started learning about DevOps, I'm like, this sounds like an amazing way to do work. So this is going on, you know, Calms is, you know, 10 years old, DevOps days was over 10 years ago. All these principles and ideas. We must be living in software nirvana now. Oh my goodness, things must be so good. What the hell happened, right? How are we still having these same conversations? So maybe one of the things that comes up is, is it all about automation? There's this idea that, you know, how many times do we talk about, talk about DevOps uh, practices and stuff, they all go back to automation tools. It's like, how are we automating this process? And I, I mentioned that, I said, automation is where we, gradually, we, we gravitate to. But DevOps isn't just about automation, that's just one of the letters in comms. Is DevOps just Kubernetes? Can we just throw some container orchestration at this stuff and we'll, we'll get ourselves a bunch of value? And the sad reality is no. I mean, I love Kubernetes. My, my car's license tag is KubeCuddle, but uh, it really is. It used to be DevOps. I have a keen sense of where the industry is going and I illustrate it in my uh, vehicle registration. Um, it's not that, and then this is one of my favorite little things. So a few years into, into the DevOps thing, there was a, thankfully short-lived movement called Enterprise DevOps. And the idea of Enterprise DevOps is it was DevOps without the C. It was AMS, you didn't need culture. And one of the proponents of this was fond of saying, culture is for yogurt. And the thing that saved us from all of that is a little thing called the DevOps Enterprise Summit. Because they put on DevOps Enterprise Summit and all these enterprises came out and talked about what they were doing and it was all about culture. And that whole little movement went away. But this is the thing, because these are the hard things. And the reality of the problem we have is this, is DevOps is being sold to you, right? And, and someone once said, you can't buy DevOps, but I can definitely sell it to you. And that was me. Uh, you know you've reached a certain level of either uh, notoriety or you know, self-satisfaction uh, when you quote yourself in your, in your talks. But this is reality, right? We got into this position where we're like, DevOps is, is this something that has been marketed and sold and great. You know, I mean, I work for DevOps vendors, it's fine. But along the way, you know, I said I wanted to, to blame Andrew for the term DevOps. And what happened is, this is how we get into this thing where we said we had DevOps, cool. But that doesn't seem very inclusive. There's more to delivering software than development and operations, so we probably need DevSecOps. Um, okay, but that's, but what about like the biz? We have everyone's in the business, we have, we're doing business value, and do we need to get serverless in there? And we need to do DevSec DB ops, ops because we have the ops for our DB ops, and then somewhere along the line, someone's done DevOps DevOps, and it kind of sucks. And 
The reality is the other alternate for this, this, uh, this, this slide would be that astronaut meme where it's like, you know, oh, DevOps includes security. It's like, or DevOps is it's like, always has been, right? But we don't understand nuance, and so we have to create all these other words to explain the thing that we've been trying to say for 12 years, and this is the problem, is that words are hard. Um, communication is hard. All this comes down to communication. Um, but don't worry, I have more words for you. So we will solve the problem with more words. But I think one of the problems that we are in is that, you know, we had this idea, we've been working on this idea, it's perhaps been misunderstood, it's been reappropriated, it's been redirected. So there's some more emergent practices that are going on now. And I think when we look at today, the other thing is, we've been talking about this for 12 years. Our landscape and our world look different in 2009, in 2011, in 2015 even, than it does today. And we're in a much more cloud world, a lot of things. And we think about this emergent practice of cloud engineering, and this is one of the ways it's been described. Modern cloud engineering is applying standard software engineering practices to our infrastructure, our application development, and our compliance. This sounds real familiar to me, right? This sounds like a lot of what we've been trying to do with DevOps. And when we think about cloud engineering, it's this sort of idea where like, we have these cloud resources, which we use to build platforms, we deploy our applications and then we, we manage them with, with policies. This is sort of the core of cloud engineering. And what I want to do here is sort of take these, these three tenets as build, deploy, and manage and say, how do we apply columns to that? Like, how do these things go together? How do we operationalize DevOps? How do we apply these ideas to things that maybe fit a little closer to our life cycle? One of the strengths and also weaknesses of the DevOps movement was to not be prescriptive. And here's the thing, it was a kind of a good idea, right? We're like, we're not gonna tell you how to do these, right? There's, it's the ideas, it's the outcomes. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, you know what happens when we don't provide ways to do it? People will try to sell you a tool to do it. So we're gonna be a little more prescriptive. Um, so when we think about the build part, like this sounds like this is just about writing code. This is about your software engineers. This is about building your applications. But when we think about the build and uh, area of cloud engineering, it's about creating the services and the infrastructure that provide what our customers need, right? And in today's world, like I said, we're using cloud resources generally to build these applications, services, and infrastructure. So it's all the things that we build. And when we kind of think about that, you know, maybe they make up a shared services platform. I mean, we've had a lot of conversations about platform engineering. This is the new hotness. Let's just, you know, again, new words, new words. But at a certain scale, shared services platforms really make a lot of sense. It's, uh, James Governor had a comment. I, I wish I had the tweet in front of me, but it was something to the effect of everybody's in a race to the bottom to recreate Heroku, right? Is what we're all trying to do. And so we want to do our own Heroku inside. But there's a reason for that because, um, and, uh, uh, there. It also is really advantageous to create reusable infrastructure components, right? The things we're building. A lot of this stuff comes as common uh, second nature from a software engineering perspective, and then we're still learning this stuff in infrastructure, right? The reason of, 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 of being able to create these reusable components, where this helps us do it is, it's letting us focus on our differentiators rather than reinventing the wheel, right? Reusable components throughout how we're doing infrastructure in our organization, this gives us a consistent and standard implementation uh, using the you know, good practices and existing practices of our teams in our, inside of our organization. Um, and then expressing our own best practices. Ooh, I just said best practices. I never say that. But I did say practices. There's more than one. And common configurations approaches when we build our infrastructure. Um, this lets us apply existing frameworks and tools, right? Here's the thing that's interesting. I, I've seen this happen in all sorts of cases in lots of organizations um, where we want to create things because it's fun. So I spent a little bit of time um, helping uh, different government agencies in the United States in their cultural transformation. Yeah, that was fun. That was in 2022. Uh, <laughs> and, and I used to say, hey, are you the U.S. Department of Continuous Delivery? Right? Because focus on that. And it's, it's, we laugh at it. You're supposed to laugh at it. That was a joke. Um, <laughs> but we do that. And there's, there's enterprises that do this. And uh, there's a, one particular one in the United States where I'm not going to call them out. It's interesting because they're generally considered a DevOps darling. You know, they're one of the ones we look at. And we're like, oh, X company does DevOps super well. And they have been continually building new tools that already exist. And the idea behind that, I think, is, well, this will make engineers want to work here because we work on this cool stuff. But that's not what you do. You are you're a retail company. You sell stuff, right? You're, you don't build deployment platforms. You don't build pager duty uh, clones, right? 
And the thing is, you're focusing your stuff on that, and it's never your most important thing. So we want to focus on differentiators, number one, because what is providing the most value to, the, to your organization, but also your side project doesn't get the funding and attention that it does when it's your main thing. Anyway, that's a whole other talk. Um, so I want to kind of step through the different ideas of columns in, in each of these and say, how does it approach? So when we think about how we're doing the build stuff, the cultural ramification of that is, again, we talked about the focus on differentiators, right? We're creating a common development experience whether you're developing in different, uh, different software engineers across different feature teams, but even your infrastructure engineers are having a similar experience in how they build things as your software engineers, as your security engineers and stuff, and that drives empathy, right? Everybody, the, the <laughs> lack of empathy comes from lack of understanding, right? So if we've, there's, uh, the easiest way to do empathy is to actually have had the same experience. Being empathetic to someone who has a completely different lived experience is way harder. Uh, so sometimes we can cheat. Uh, when we think about the automation part, right, it's reusable components, lets us move more quickly on that, leveraging those ecosystems as I talked about, and avoiding those bespoke implementations, the artisanally crafted pipelines, if you will. Um, from Lean, this is helping us focus on value. I, as I alluded to, I'm like, what is the most important value that you're providing? And again, this doesn't mean that everything's about the almighty dollar or pound or euro or whatever currency. It's not just about the capitalism, but it's still the value. Is it providing value to your internal or external customers appropriately? And this also lets us review for improvement, the more that we're having this shared thing, because it all consistency breeds visibility. Right? The more similarly we're doing things over and over again, it surfaces our ability to see. And from a sharing perspective, a lot of this again is this, uh, by leveraging an existing ecosystem that promotes outside sharing, right? That one of the big values of open source in general uh, is that we can learn from each other, right? In the stuff that is not our secret sauce. You know, it does not help, you do not disrupt Netflix by knowing how they ship software. Right? Netflix is not going to open source the recommendation algorithm, but their deployment thing, you can't go disrupt them because you know how they do that. We can all get better together. And uh, this, again, helps us learn from existing practices. So now we kind of go to the next tenet, which is deploy. And this is, you know, it doesn't count until it's in production, right? I mean, I've written a lot of code that no one's ever seen. That's a good thing that a lot of people haven't seen it. Um, so code and infrastructure don't give any value until it's in front of our users or customers or, or uh, colleagues, right? But doing it in a manner that's highly efficient and quality consistent is what's really key. And deployment processes that take too long or require too many manual steps can absolutely block us from getting new features to our customers or resolving service issues. When we have incidents and stuff, we, we have to be able to do this stuff relatively quickly. So. The, uh, when we apply software engineering practices to our deployment process, this ensures that we ship the same way every time. Um, and I mean every time, okay? Uh, a lot of times when we talk about having a process for deploying software, the, one of the first things that comes up is, okay, that's great, but what about when there's an outage? Like, I need a way to bypass the process because this important thing happened. And um, I spent a fair amount of time uh, working in ITIL shops and ITSM shops. And the one thing I've learned is that when uh, you have an exception process, what that means is everything becomes an exception, <laughs> right? If you're like, well, if you follow the standard process, it'll take two weeks, but if it's an exception, it can go in three hours. Guess what happens? Everything becomes an exception. And uh, it's become common practice for us to apply the principles of continuous integration and continuous delivery to how we build application software. But when we kind of apply these same principles with our infrastructure, that means that our new and uh, updated infrastructure resources meet our quality controls and help us understand you know, what changed. And Security is just another aspect of quality in my mind. And this is letting us put quality and security checks along every change that we're making. Holy cow, really? I thought I had 35 minutes. Okay, well, speed run through the end. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, checklists are really great, but we need to automate them, right? So they're built by people, but we let automated systems apply those checklists, which helps us with the consistency of, of doing things the same way each time. And um, the infrastructure, when we treat our infrastructure as part of the application, this, uh, it becomes, it's, it's not just sort of a side thing, right? The application is what creates value in many cases, the infrastructure is there to support that. Uh, how do we apply these things to columns? Uh, the, the culture of, again, it doesn't count until it's in prod, 
right? We have to get it, and this is that fast feedback, these short feedback loops of iterative development, um, which enables our continuous improvement. Uh, when you think about our, our pipelines, pipelines are great. They're especially great when they're relatively consistent inside your organization. Every squad doesn't need a completely different way to deploy software. And again, I love checklists. The thing about automated checks, the wonderful and frustrating thing about computers is they're jerks, right? So when we have a process that a person has to approve, People do favors for each other sometimes, right? We, we've all done it, it's fine, it's not even a judgment. You know, you might be like, hey, I gotta get this thing out, the you know, CMO's breathing on my neck, I gotta get this thing, hey, you know what, Maddie, can you just like, just push it, the test is red, so I can just push it, like, all right, you know what, for you, this one time. Computer's like, screw you, buddy, I don't care. You know, so that's the wonderful and terrible thing about computers is they are jerks. Uh, and checklists are great, let's automate them. Um, this again, we talked about it, it uh, enables fast feedback and it gives us this visibility into the supply chain. This is a pretty hot topic of the last year or two, these software bill of materials, right? Understanding all the things that bring that together and we have a consistent uh, approach to our deployment that gives us that visibility to also identify those bottlenecks as well as those threats. Uh, again, this is giving us our visibility. We're able to measure that cycle time. Cycle time is kind of, again, that commit to cash. How long does it take to get from an idea to value? Uh, and it's not just about speed though. You know, I sort of alluded to that. I said, hey, it was Flickr, it was, oh, 10 deploys a day, holy cow. And you're like, oh, Amazon deploys a thousand times a minute. We should do that too. No, should you? Are you Amazon? But it's the ability to move at the speed that's appropriate to what your business needs to be able to provide that value. Um, and again, it gets into this, everyone knows what changed, right? When something goes squirrely, what's the first thing we ask? What changed? Because stuff doesn't just break magically. Something changed, maybe we didn't change it, maybe our customers changed behavior. But we wanna be able to isolate those, those pieces. And then finally, when we think about sort of the managed piece, uh, what does this mean? Getting our services into production is a key step, but it's not the end. Just getting it to production, I mean, Heck, how, how many people have been seeing, this is not your first DevOps talk you've seen, right? So how many, you've all seen the wall of confusion slide, I'm sure, right? Which is the old, old, terrible olden days when those jerk developers used to throw stuff over the wall to the poor downtrodden ops people, right? Theoretically, we don't think that way anymore, but we still do a little bit. We're like, okay, well, at least we shipped it, but we have to continue to run. Our services don't just stop. We're not, we're not literally shipping software on a, a CD-ROM to people anymore. Um, I don't know, maybe you are. Is anybody, anybody actually shipping on physical media? I know someone's got to be doing it. Um, maybe we'll have an open space about that. But the thing is, our customers are constantly using our services and applications. So it's not just about continuing to run to add features, but just our customers' behaviors change, their uses change, it, everything's a moving target. So this, we have to be able to manage all those resources. And, you know, uh, might have heard the, uh, the adage that security is everyone's job. I have a lot of thoughts on shift left. Again, it's a short term that has nuance and we suck at nuance. Um, we want to shift the, uh, the attention to the left. It's not just dump all the work to the left. But again, what do you think most people are doing? Um, the idea is that we consider, but the I, real truth is we consider security and compliance. And I talk about uppercase and lowercase compliance. Right, whether it's regulatory policies or just our organizational policies, to be closely integrated into our work. So if we're treating our policy as code, just like infrastructure is code, this is really powerful. Because when we express those policies as code, rather than prose in a document that's written up in some Google Doc or Word document, uh, we can apply those checks just like any other test. This also gives us common vocabulary across our compliance, our security, our operational teams, regardless of where they sit in the, uh, the org chart. And that gives us that visibility. Um, again, this is a nuanced statement. Security is everyone's job does not mean you need to get rid of people whose jobs are security. It means it's just a thing we think about. It, it would, it, I always used to say that uh, when I said that security and quality are closely linked, if I were to say, okay, in our world, we do not do any quality checks until the very last week before we deploy something, you would think I was nuts, or you would have worked at some of the places I've worked. But we do that with security all the time. We do hardening sprints, and we only pay attention to the end, and then we, of course, have to ship it, which means we get an exception from the security team, and I got news for you. The bad guys on the internet don't care that you have a note from your mom that says it's okay. They're still gonna hack you. So again, this common vocabulary enables our empathy, and the other thing is that controls and processes enable and enhance. So guardrails are actually really empowering, right? If I put things in place so that I can then feel like it's very hard for me to accidentally drop the production database, 
then I'm going to be a little more careful or a little less, uh, a little more confident in, in making other changes. So um, again, guardrails enable that helps what helps us with our culture. Our collaboration is enabled through a common code experience, and this increases a common understanding across disciplines, which is kind of the core of DevOps. Um, the automation part, again, computers, in addition to being jerks, they also can't lie. So a whole other conversation about audit theater. I've been involved in so many audits that came down to, Maddie, do you always do this? Oh, yes, I do, of course. Yes, of course I do that every time. The computers will actually give us the actual answer. Um, gives us trust in our process and our checks. Um, when you think about the lean approach to that, this is letting us de determine the improvements for safety and is expressing those value stream changes in a codified way. Um, this gives us visibility into our current policy because when our policy is expressed in a Word document sitting in a SharePoint folder somewhere, we don't necessarily know what's true. We used to, I used to think that you know, infrastructure as code is uh, executable documentation. The same thing is true for executable policy. Uh, it gives us our, our view of our current state of compliance and helps, most importantly to me, helps us understand when policy and value collide. Right? It's like, hey, we have this policy, but it's giving us a challenge in expressing value. We want to see where those happen so we can then have a conversation and figure out what we should be doing. And from the sharing perspective, again, we have a shared vocabulary, um, helping us utilize success patterns in different parts of our roles and teams and squads inside our organization, and helps us share the learning um, when we do have incidents and things, one, one fun fact real quick, uh, when J. Paul Reed did his uh, master's thesis on uh, post-incident reviews, he found that the larger the organization, the less likely teams were to share their post-mortems with each other. Whereas, ironically, those are the organizations that need to do it the most, right? So what I'm suggesting here is basically let's take DevOps back, right? What was DevOps really about? It's about those principles, about those ideas. Let's work together. Let's bring it back to what it's been. Um, thank you very much. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, my slides and a bunch of other resources are at speaking.mattstratton.com. Um, we occasionally still do my podcast uh, called Arrested DevOps, and I look forward to chatting with all of you in the open spaces.